Welcome all to today's discussion and study circle. Uh, it's a continuation from our Monday talk about uh, global history and the future of global history and the question that were raised that is global history in a crisis. Uh, and today we have Holger Weiss. Hello. Martin Skosema. Hello. I'm Patrick Hettula, and then we also have Laura Holstein and Johan Erstedt. So we are continuing today the discussion with two uh, new texts published this year that are reactions to Adaman and Bell. Uh, Bell is a new figure here, but Holger, could you just introduce these new texts? Yes, uh, today we are going to discuss uh, Richard Drayton's and David Motterdell's uh, Response to Adelman and Bell in uh, the first issue of this year's uh, Journal of Global History, 2018, uh, volume 13, uh, titled Discussion, the Futures of Global History, uh, which very nicely, of course, uh, sums up the argument and critique. Well, let's see put in this way, uh, whether it was a critique or not, because then there's also a response by Adelman to uh, Drayton and Montero in, in the same uh, issue. Uh, we will discuss uh, Drayton's and Montero's uh, kind of reflections and, and positions uh, towards uh, what is global history and what is the future, what can be the future of global history. But as we also noticed last time when we discussed uh, Adelman's text, and we kind of contrasted is it with the text of Franz Philofer, uh, is that we have a kind of parallel discussion going on, which is more theoretical reflections about uh, what global history could be all about. And that's why we uh, also kind of combine this discussion by Drayton and Mottler's reflection on Adelman with uh, Angelika Eppel's article in uh, History and Theory Volume 57, number 3, from September 2011, 2018, excuse me, titled Calling for a Practice Turn in Global History, Practices as Drivers of Globalization, Globalizations, with singular slash plural, uh, which what I see is a kind of interesting mix that we have been discussing uh, last time uh, that we're going to discuss now is that we have one group of discussing global history as whether or not it is in a crisis, and of course, as we will see today, Drayton and Motterdell have a different perspective and a different position on that, whereas Apple and Philofa, in a sense, kind of try to open up the whole discussion about what is global history all about, which actually Drayton and Motterdell, neither Drayton and Motterdell nor uh, Adelman actually have been tackling this kind of more, from a more theoretical position about what global history could be all about. So that's going to be today's topic. Maybe we could start with uh, with Laura and Johan, who weren't here on Monday, but on uh, your reflections. Yes, um, thank you, Holger, for uh, bringing these really, really interesting articles to uh, our attention. Firstly, I want to say that I did listen to the podcast from last Monday, uh, and I had a look at one of the texts uh, you discussed, which uh, the uh, Drayton and Motterdell text today uh, is a response to. And I have to say that I very much agree. Uh, I think this is a great text because it addresses some of the, I think, quite unfair criticism put uh, uh, forwarded in, in the first text. But uh, my reflection when I've firstly listened to your podcast and secondly read some of the material is that uh, there is an ideological discussion here which uh, at least we haven't really been um, conducting among ourselves. In contrast to uh, other disciplines, uh, such as women's history or environmental history, who, which uh, can have a, a very a strong political agenda in global history, 
uh, until now. I don't think that it has it has uh, been very prominent uh, unless we go back to world systems theory and and uh, uh, that sort of. Uh, niche in, in, in the subfield of uh, world history. So I thought it was really interesting at, that, at this particular uh, moment in history uh, with uh, nationalism on the rise, we should be reflecting uh, these questions. And what sprang to my mind, because I was really surprised uh, when I read about the positive spin on networks, connections, uh, cosmopolitanism, because it hasn't really occurred to me to consider, uh, cons consider these uh, phenomena as positive. But of course, you could see them as a continuation of, of the Enlightenment ideals and as Whig history. On the other hand, similarly to women's history or, or environmental history in the 1970s, uh, you also have a critical movement in the 1990s, 90s, which was against globalization. There was a political debate against globalization as being something, an expression of intensified, uh, you know, capitalism. So it's interesting that you can view global history both as something Whiggish, uh, and on the other hand, uh, you might see it as a reaction to the critique on globalization. So I thought this in itself was was uh, quite uh, refreshing, but I'll stop here for now. I could here, I would like to uh, disagree with you on the very last point that you made, that, or just um, I would like to f uh, further elaborate on a bit on part in the 1990s, it's true. There were, uh, there were plenty of criticism against globalization, but uh, I think it's epistemologically uh, wrong to call it anti-globalization. It was more of a kind of like, because the reaction was came mostly from, uh, how do you want to define them, progressive circles. And the critique uh, was based upon the idea that too much power gets concentrated in too few hands. So it was kind of like a push for a more democratic versions of globalization or globalizations. It was not like a reaction. Back then, it was not like a reactionary uh, impulse, but it was more like a, came from a more progressive quarters. Uh, but then, uh, to the text at hand, um, I one more thing. I mean, I think you spoke really well there, Laura. Uh, that uh, sprung to my mind is that what none of these texts, as far as I could read them they how to say they they don't elaborate that much on the base like the basic tenets of of writing scientific history they seem to take it like kind of like for granted that this is just a squabble about this like this or that detail be they big or small details i mean that for instance in the uh, in angelica eppel's text how she's uh, he, she puts forward the claim that global historians have realized that there is no such thing as a no neutral position or like you're always the knowledge is always always situated uh, but I was like yeah but this is like these kind of discussions have been commonplace a number of years already among historians at how to discuss uh, the question of uh, situated knowledge it's not something that the global historians now have come with this great revelation that's my mm. less than two cents well for me um, I, I agree um, entirely with the flow of discussion so far. And, um, <clears throat> Johan, you've mentioned something that really strikes me and has been actually very problematic to me also as I've read history, and it's been the notion of, uh, of the scientific tenets or the tenets of writing scientific history. And that actually has been one of the problems I've found in history study circles and all that. That sounds to me like almost a, a loss of a theoretical perspective to to what it is that we actually aim to achieve when we write history, and that has been um, actually also we've seen from from these articles today that you know um, it's been like a, more like a flat narrative so to speak, and even the critique of 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 history and global history has it been coming from a, a, a theoretical perspective, uh, 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 an understanding or a grasp of, 
of, of theory, which I think should be the driving force to any um, academic discourse in our epistemology of academia today. And as I think that, um, that that could be one perspective to where all of this criticism arises from. But, but in thinking about globalization, and global history. Uh, what we see, like Laura, you noted that um, nationalism on the rise today. I think a lot about, um, I think a lot about nationalism as I see it when I read the history of Africa, the 20th century Africa, in the sense that in the 1960s, when the um, discourses actually saw this breakdown and coming together, shrinking of space. Uh, the nations we see today in Africa were actually, they actually became the shrinking of um, protectorate, so to speak, into what they call a nation state, which I see as, I see it as a precursory um, notion towards a more globalized or globalized, um, a globalized world, so to speak. And what then we see today is a rise of a different kind of nationalism, which is more, <laughs> which more emphasizes on resistance to what, like Johan said, um, about resistance to that concentration of power in few hands. Unlike the nationalism and the national histories, which um, Drayton speaks about here, being a history from the national perspective towards an inclusion. I mentioned it in the last uh, podcast where it's almost to me a, a, a conflict between an inclusive discourse and a resistive discourse and how global history should address both discourses. But in the, in the larger narrative, I still see global history being achieved even if we write about resistance or inclusiveness in terms of this, I still see a narrative. So that's, I think, one of the interesting points I see in Drayton's article on, you know, these futures and what possible futures could be for global history and, and all that. But, but I'll stop here for now uh, as we have deeper. I agree with you, Martins, in the way that there was, there has been... Uh, somewhat a lack of a theoretical approach to the critique. Uh, on the other hand, the uh, the reactions have more or less been to showcase the uh, well-written global history historical works. Uh, so it's been more or less like a historian works through his uh, sources, and these some of these uh, works, well-known works, have been the staple sources for well-written global history. So uh, actually they are quite, I, I think they are trying to construct a discourse of what global history should be in a written product. And there was some emphasis on, on big monographs, I would say. Uh, so still there was this kind of a move towards these all-encompassing histories that um, uh, we have discussed uh, that aren't the only way into into to global history. And Adaman himself reacts that, of course, he has re he has read uh, well written global historical uh, works, and sh should there be a discourse for global history that uh, uh, that doesn't take into consideration the things that we discussed in our last podcast this multi-layeredness of histories, uh, simultaneous uh, stories and narratives, and also these kind of different ideological drives that are integrating or disintegrating, and, and uh, this kind of reaction and resistance that, that also is embed, embedded in this kind of uh, research in, in global history. Uh, and I think that many historians have already uh, put forth good kind of definitions to where global history is at the present state. Uh, Conrad's What is Global History is one of them. I'd say that uh, Adelman, he uses the word muddish and he uses the word, uh, like words that it's, it's difficult to, to define global history. But, but he, he doesn't make an attempt to do it, in a way. Conrad is one who has. 
Conrad has tried to place different uh, genres of global history in a in a in a like scale them on the on the map from big histories to micro histories and all all that is in between. I I like the the text by by Apple uh, where she discusses uh, the roles of agents and actions and practices in the in the research field, uh, where I, where I'm reflecting a lot of uh, on my own research where it's usually. Uh, individuals and their actions that are placed in a context of global history. And I was thinking about the maybe the the question of ideology in global history. It, if it's I, I don't know what kind of a political ideology there could be behind uh, different uh, or there might be several of course, but I was thinking about uh, a capitalist view of global history could emerge from these kind of actor-based uh, theories where, in a way, a capitalist vision of somebody trying to expand uh, their means of, of uh, product and, and, and capital. Uh, whereas, again, there is this other parallel path or a simultaneous path where somebody could uh, work against this trend of capitalism? For, for me, kind of, as I already pointed out, that, that we have these four essays. What, what I see is kind of, and, and here I, I refer to a reflection that our colleagues at the Global History Center at, at Warwick University made when they were reading uh, Adelman, and it can be read on their, their blog. Is that that kind of the the future? What they su suggest is, or what what they see is a kind of uh, instead of global history in, in singular, you have global histories in plural. And one outcome, and this is also discussed uh, by Drayton and Motta, and in their ar article is of course that uh, could be, uh, or at least interesting. We have s haven't seen that much yet, but it's it is already there by some would be a kind of global micro-histories. And that's that's all fine with me, and, and that's kind of uh, Adelman's, Straitens, and Mottadel's uh, argument is is kind of goes in the same direction that uh, what is, what is not, is the crisis, the not a crisis, and so on, about uh, what is now being written, what is now produced, what has been produced, which kind of, of stories have, are there on the table at the moment. But uh, for me, kind of, and that's why Philippers and Apple's uh, discussions are important to, to kind of integrate is that, and this has been my biggest problem with global history all the time, is that what, what is the global in global history? How should we define the global? If it's not the kind of grand narrative that, that we are after, which Philippers kind of pointed out, that, that this is one kind of basic kind of uh, development in by especially Western European uh, historians culminating during the Enlightenment era of, of having this kind of universal perception. And, and if this is kind of, if, if you're still there, which is Philippe's critique in a sense, then, I mean, what is the difference between if, if we kind of ask our colleagues and ask the monographs and articles written with a tag global, whatever, global history of this and that's a connection, that, is the kind of, are they, is the projection this kind of grand synthesis or, or whatever it is, uh, is it part of a modernization project, is it a part of whatever that 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 uh, the stories that they produce are kind of point new boards. And of course, this is one, one of the critiques that Adelman had, that, that uh, global historians have been quite engaged by kind of still unconsciously consciously being part of that progressive, story of uh, a world that respects multiculturalism, uh, cosmopolitanism, uh, the voices of the few, the voices of the, of the weak, and so on, and all these good things. And the crisis, what he sees, and I also see the crisis, is that, that we are very, global historians are, are at the moment not very good in explaining what went wrong. Why did this kind of trajectory of kind of that we are 
in a way, this enlightenment idea that, that progressing towards something uh, which could be better, a better world, a better future, and so on. And then we have this backlash uh, all over the world with rising forces of whatever who do not seem to be part of that story. And of course, Drayton and Montadel kind of the answer is that yes, we have been focusing also on these, let's, let's say, dark forces or whatever and so on. And when I say dark forces, I already am putting myself into this enlightenment narrative because uh, why do I use the expression dark, for example? But for me then, Apple's uh, essay points towards more a kind of reflect, more theoretical reflection about if we take it, take this argument of many histories, many global histories for kind of uh, as a, as a kind of serious engagement. What does it mean? Uh, and how can we kind of, from a theoretical reflection, work on uh, how to conduct uh, uh, global histories or, or towards working towards global histories? And I think, uh, of course, for our group, uh, and for me, uh, the this goes back to Lefebvre and the question of control of space, where you kind of have these movements towards uh, those in power, whoever that might be, who wants to control space, and then you have these counter movements uh, who, at the moment when you think that you control a space, you have already a counter movement being established. And kind of this uh, means that you never have this one space, uh, one particular power being capable of controlling a space. The Apple's discussion then uh, on uh, relational history, polyphonic history, and so on, and which kind of arises from this spatial reflection, which is absent in Motales and Drayton's and Adelman's reflection, because they don't get into uh, the critique from a theoretical point of view. They come in, the, their critique is a political one to my understanding. And I think that uh, we, we should be capable of moving from the political to the theoretical one and kind of see that, that if, if we take this, this spatial turn as something which is interesting, what will then happen? Uh, yes, I agree that we should move on from the political critique to, um, to the more theoretical one, uh, particularly as I don't see that global historians have failed very badly in explaining what went wrong, uh, it's all there for everybody to see. Uh, the new nationalist movements are a reaction towards uh, certain aspects of globalization and the very uh, things that we are talking about. Um, but uh, about uh, the uh, theoretical theoretical points that have been raised, I also appreciated um, Apple's article very much. Uh, but firstly, because she's starting with uh, the Space Odyssey and uh, the David Bowie song and so forth. Um, and as most uh, writers on global history uh, takes a position against uh, a planetary history, a big history. Um, and uh, as somebody interested in that very kind of history, uh, I have an objection here, uh, because we have uh, at this table discussed scales previously. Uh, and I see no problem whatever in combining various scales, where a planetary view sometimes might be one of those scales. Because after all, uh, in present day discourse, it's there all the time. And she even ends her article with some metaphors mm -hmm. um, as to that extent. So it's somehow impossible to get away from this planetary view. Mm -hmm. However, I think it's uh, important to combine it with uh, other scales. And she has a suggestion. Uh, on how to do that. Well, maybe not. Uh, she more speaks about, speak or writes about uh, the relationship between actor and structure, um, uh, practice theory, uh, which is 
I think, something that uh, could be discussed because uh, I think one of the approaches that has been uh, has been employed here and particularly by Holger uh, is in localizing the global. And I think that's one of uh, the methods uh, for maybe not overcoming all of these problems, but still it's a method of overcoming some of these problems, adopting a spatial turn uh, and um, ident identifying the global in the local, because uh, then we do not have to uh, write about elites. Then we do not have to write about uh, uh, cosmopolitans on the move. We can stay with people who are stationary. We can stay with people who are not part of uh, migration movements. Uh, by the way, uh, I have to object to uh, thinking about migration as uh, something uh, Whiggish and glamorous, because I think mostly it's a very tragic phenomenon, full of tragic stories about poor people. Um, so uh, I really, I really welcome uh, these theoretical ideas, and of course she has an interesting example with the automaton, uh, the history of, of um, the, you know, automaton uh, serving food in cafeterias at various places on the globe. Mm. Uh, first, what uh, Holger said previously about that global historians being progressive, so like uh, like adhering to this idea of kind of like progress in history. Uh, there's some grain of truth to that, but I would also claim that you can also write very, how to say, conservative global histories. I think here as a global history could be more seen kind of like a, a method, not like a political standpoint. The fact that most uh, writers of global history have been like, uh, maybe not enlightenment, believing in light, enlightenment uh, pr kind of progress, but still progressives in other ways. That's that's true. Uh, for the second, uh, what Laura said about this, that bringing the global back to local, then uh, I agree, and there, of course, but then we come also to the question of available source materials, uh, which is the, the lord and lady we all bow to all the time in our everyday work. Uh, then um, a third thing is that I was very impressed by uh, how Apple, I mean, the, the, dis dis uh, the discussion in her paper, but then uh, I started to raise my eyebrows very much indeed uh, when she discusses this with like how we should start with the smallest unit, which is the actor. And then I was like, uh, I mean, is this kind of now the prime mover for her? Because, I mean, considering how much she discusses uh, uh, was it relationships and the relational, uh, what is the actor, if not also a product of relations and being embedded in, rela in how, how do you say that in English? Mm. Being relational. Mm. I, mean, I, I mean, this is kind of like as if you have the actor as something like unchanged, fundamental, the ground. I think I read it a little bit differently that uh, I think I'd didn't see Apple as describing the actor as the as the smallest nominator, but the act as the smallest nominator. It might be that I have uh, misunderstood this. Still, I would like to just uh, an, uh, continue to, to the discussion on uh, the theoretical approach in global history. That, that I, I would say that many historians today have arrived to global history and did not start out as global historians, which in a way drives the discussion uh, in different directions. This table and, and we who stand around this table have also arrived to global history from different uh, research interests. And, uh, and I would also agree more or less on that global history may be seen as an instrument, uh, a method than a st standing point. Uh, that I would agree on. I think that uh, the laboratory in itself is uh, trying to be this experimental forum for uh, conducting uh, global history research or global history, like a think tank, uh, thinking about different approaches to global history where we have worked with space and spatiality 
and scales on, 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 on a regular basis. And the discussion of agents, agency, interrelatedness, connectedness, or disconnectedness, and these all play a part of a big whole. Uh, and I also agree on that we aren't trying to describe a flat global historical past that that changes through time, that we could just make these kind of cut through moments in, in time and describe the global history of that singular moment. Uh, that's not and has never been at least our intention. Yeah, I agree with you, especially when thinking about the whole flat uh, approach to describing a particular kind of global history. And I am now that I'm going through uh, thinking all over over my head, I'm, I'm beginning to appreciate more the spatial turn, uh, the emphasis on space, and um, in regards to the rising sentiments um, towards multiple global histories, uh, especially multiple national global histories, so to speak. But the national history, we must understand that it's also a space, you see. And, and by bringing the, nas the national histories, we, have, we understand that we are talking about the creation of, sp of a space and probably um, a narration of events in that particular space. And, and um, another question that we could ask is, whose space? I mean, if you think about that from that perspective, from the nationalist perspective, whose space then has been encircled in that nation or that nation space? Or probably whose might be too arbitrary, but how did the creation of that space come to be? And then how, de how then does the does this creation reflect on the kind of global histories that would be written from that perspective? And so um, I think I, I thought that was also one um, interesting aspect. And also the idea of um, ideology in history and, and remembering what Patrick said about a, a, a capitalist ideology of writing global history. What other alternatives do we have? Except in my reading, I see from 1948 with Karl Marx and the introduction of the, and when we got the Communist Manifesto and all that. But then, are those the only two alternatives we could embrace? What other alternatives could we, could we, you know, draw in, pull in to understanding how we should write global history? So these are just questions that, I, I just think probably we could, I could think about further as we move on. I was just, um, what you and Patrick said, it made me think of uh, also like, uh, where as we, uh, when we discuss uh, nationalism as a political phenomen, uh, phenomenon in our time, I mean, uh, there also we should uh, talk about nationalisms because I would like to believe that not all uh, nationalists are rabid xenophobes or conservative patriarchs or whatever, but it's. I think it's a bit too. Uh, it's. Uh, I think this is more like with regard to contemporary political discussions, that what is this nationalism? Because uh, even when you discuss, I mean, the electoral success or like albeit not as big as they wanted it to be, of the Sweden Democrats in Sweden, it is very clear from uh, accompanying analysis that for most people. It was not the, the the issue of immigration was not their priority. That there were other reasons for voting the Sweden Democrats than just that there are too many migrants coming. So I think it's also this is a bit too convenient to juxtapose global with national because neither are both are in you have to conceive of both in plural sense. Just a short comment there. There I I think that the discussion about. Uh, space and ownership of space or uh, the, the power relations of space is also a very interesting discussion for global historians who, who, at least in our discussions, we usually see these layers of spaces. It works better in Swedish where we have the word rum for space. And rum is in itself plural. 
uh, it might also be singular, but we m might have the equipment to think about space as being a, a not an empty chamber that is filled up with one liquid, but a, a, a chamber where there exists uh, simultaneously there exist many different ideologies or views or or even uh, histories and narratives that can or might not uh, connect and be uh, more or less entangled and th th this discussion of, of, of space is, is, is a very it's a fruitful discussion where nationalism today uh, is also a product of globalization I mean, the rhetoric of nationalists today is uh, border crossing. Uh, they are trying to actually uh, connect with other nationalists in, in, in different spaces. But, the, uh, but there's still a question of power and who tries to uh, grab the power of a space or of a discourse. Whereas Adaman, I think he reacts to this, uh, to to Trump and to to different uh, phenomena in 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 Europe and elsewhere, where there has been a like a rhetoric of a resistance to globalization uh, by the the advent of uh, making their own nation great again. This. Uh, grabbing or empowering themselves again against the the, the threat of globalization, uh, which is a actually something that is more or less uh, a, a fight about who has the right to the rhetorical narrative of nat nation uh, and 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 space. Uh, I want to take our discussion back to the theoretical level. Uh, away from, from politics, which of course is always interesting, but uh, for me uh, the question is of course when, when I'm doing global history, when I'm researching global history, I mean, that's, that's one thing and the outcome is a book on connections, on comparisons, on context, on change, on all the things that, that we kind of put as a marker for uh, uh, global historical writing and, and research and so on. And of course the question is that it's not about uh, which type of empirical sources that are available. Uh, they are or they, well, then they are not. But for me the question is that when, when I'm doing this type of, of research, uh, what am I doing? What is the, the, the theoretical kind of, if I try to bring it down, of what I'm doing, let's say my, my present, what I'm doing right now, when I'm writing on the international seamen harbor workers. But what 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 type of story am I writing, which kind of forces me on a, on a theoretical reflections up, reflection about that it is not national history. So what is the, it is is it then? And if I say okay, I'm I'm trying to take space seriously. What what does space mean for me? What that what does place mean? What is territory? What are these networks that I'm talking about? What uh, what is the scale that I'm moving? So kind of I'm I'm that's why I was so so kind of thrilled by it, by Chesops uh, and uh, Brenner's TSPN framework, which kind of gave me uh, the tools to put my thoughts in a more theoretical way, in which I kind of, historians usually, I mean, that's, that, I'm the old school uh, historian. Uh, when I came into the field, we had little mythological, mythological reflections, but we were good at was the critical examination of our sources, and we had absolutely no theory. And usually what we, they would do if we could go to the social sciences or any other sciences and, and take in whatever theoretical reflections. And that, I think, still is the, is the position of global history. When, when we move, when we kind of go back to the Adelman trade and model discussion, is that there is, it is about outcomes and perspectives, but it's not so much about theoretical reflections about what we are doing. Um, what you described here is a question of, of uh, what the toolkit of, of uh, 
global historians, or in this case you, uh, should look like, which is very uh, important. But uh, I think the categories or, or uh, the variables that you mentioned um, are so numerous, so it would n you would have to choose. You would have to make a choice of you know one fourth or one third of all those things that you mentioned, because it's impossible to manage those, and that of course happens in um, a dialogue with the source material, and uh, that's something we have to discuss with any case that we are working on. Are these categories, are these um, uh, concepts, and so on, uh, working in in my particular case? Uh, but I would like to come back um, briefly uh, to the idea of uh, where people uh, come from when they start doing global history, because uh, that has a bearing on how they are going to work and what what categories they are going to use. Some people come from uh, post-colonialism, and in that uh, sense, uh, it's a certain set of concepts and categories that they will work with. Others might be micro-historians who have a case of uh, somebody going to a shop in the 18th century buying a product which turns out to have a really, really interesting commodity chain, which is global. Um, and there are all kinds of there are all and, and somebody somebody uh, might uh, come from a more sociological point of view as uh, the world system theorist that I mentioned uh, and and maybe also in this text when we are discussing uh, the uh, practices and how practices are born which I still find quite intriguing uh, because I have I haven't done that uh, look how uh, acts uh, repeated acts become uh, a practice which then solidifies into a structure which then is not um, anything that determines things but which will have a very powerful influence on, on uh, individuals. So I think th this is something that I'm taking with me from this session, thinking about what practices I can identify in the cases that I'm working on. And I would also... Um like to talk about the fact that when we talk about theory we you know from my understanding of theory I see theory helps to explain a phenomenon and by posing models that help you know test if probably some propositions are in line with what it is that has been hypothesized or not and in this sense I begin to think about uh, Hoga's question when you asked about what is global in, the gl in, in global history. In other words, uh, an approach to theory for global history should be able to explain the phenomena of the global. What really is this global we are talking about? And, and from the example of the seamen, which is uh, a major part of your work and all that, we, we, we try to talk about how the you know, the s discussions on space and territories and skills and all that, on how we could apply that to the narrative of the seamen and, and that portion, that pocket of time that explains that event. But then on, the na on a larger narrative, we would, I'm asking myself, connections to what? Or skills of connections to, to what? I think that should be where our quest for um, theory should be. In other words, connections to a certain global, but we've not yet theorized the global which we intend to write about in global history. And so in a way, I see that as, as the level of the conflict that arises when we think about, you know, networks, skills, territories, and all that, as they, as they align towards the global, but then we are left bare naked in, in a way, so to speak, in the sense that we are not theorizing what they are connected to, but we already assume <coughs> a theoretical explicitness of this. So, so I, I think that's one of the challenges I, I see when I, when I think about it, this. But also then I remember Sohail Nayastula, which I talk a lot about in my work, 
who developed this theory of causal layered analysis, where he tries to depict the world, uh, the, the, or the vertical arrangement of reality through layers, through a layered structure. And he talks about when research gets to a point where mythology is as important as mathematics which I think it's that's one of the perspective I see um, Drayton talk about at the end of his work where he speaks about a possible future for global history where learning new languages and and other forms of uh, social exclusions are being integrated into and 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 into into that 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 future of global history. And I, I think uh, it, it points us to the fact that there's a huge task ahead. And it's still new, but it's interesting that we in this laboratory uh, are beginning to, to think about these things and, and charting our own future in line with the possible, probable, or desirable futures for global history. And I think that's, that's really what makes it more interesting. I, I really like the question that uh, the the question was that uh, a relation to what, yeah. and and I was thinking also about the global. Uh, now we we've discussed about also the the global south, the global south being more or less taken uh, seriously uh, by global historians and other academics as a uh, well. In, in the worst case, a juxtaposition uh, to the global north. I mean, it, that, it's not beneficial for us to to also create these kind of two competing uh, alternatives. I um, uh, also think that in in this laboratory we have we have discussed the, the TPSN, the Jessop methodology, but we have also tried to implement a fifth variable that is time and i think also that in in that case when we're looking into history we usually we are looking back into a time where also the pace and time was different and from our perspective the global is instant because we today have the the global network that is the the internet but also considering these other kinds of, of paces of uh, information flows and imagined uh, spaces of the global. Because for some who might have seen themselves as uh, globally thinking actors in a global space, cosmopolitan or what, whatever you want to call them, still the global might have been a much slower moving uh, space than, than for us here, mm. when we when we record this uh, discussion and and it's edited and and published, it's available throughout the globe instantly. So also, it, it, it is not a critique to your question. Actually, it's more or less also that we have to take into consideration these kinds of settings where where time moves at a different pace also, and the global is also seen as moving. A, 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 an actor in itself moving at a different pace where time plays plays a big part. Mm. I will comment on, 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 on your last uh, section where you opened a totally new discussion about the Global South, which I think we have to come back to. Uh, I just want now to, uh, tying up with Apple's reflection, uh, when you say the Global South, what is the Global South? And who defines the Global South? And when we speak about the global south, are we not kind of going back to this enlightenment way of seeing us and them? Because it's we who design and define the global south. Because if you do not, if you say it's the others who define the global south, then uh, it's the same thing. But if you take any actor wanting and being capable of particip participating, let's say, in research on global history, why does it matter to speak about the global south and, and, and the global north? What is the difference of a historian in, now in quotation marks, the global south and a historian in the global north, if they want to kind of work on that uh, 
whatever theme and so on. Mm. So if you go back to the Apple's pers perspective, I think that we should skip, or at least we should critically reflect upon what do we mean about when we speak about the global south. Now this is a, was a kind of critique to co towards post-colonialism and so on, because it uh, there is a problem when we, when we kind of unconsciously victimize or unconsciously downplay the capacity to participate or at least the will to participate. Now then we have power structures and so on who makes it impossible and so on. Not everyone has a computer to listen to our uh, podcast, for example. But uh, I think Global South uh, and who defines the Global South is that I think in most of any publications the Global South is defined by uh, researchers, uh, activists in the, the so-called global north, and there is kind of we haven't solved the problem. There would be a lot to talk about if we would talk about uh, the north and the south, the west and the east. Um, often uh, people talk about the west and the rest, and for me, it's not at all self-evident that we belong to the west. I don't think we belong to the west. We might belong to the north, but, but we do not belong to the west. So we could think about our own identification as historians, uh, where we d do we want to identify ourselves with the west, and in that case, case why? Uh, might we want to identify with the East? And in that case, why? Because because uh, there are a number of choices that we can make. But I would like to, to uh, comment on Patrick uh, when you said that in a specific time in the past, uh, a person might not, or a person might have uh, seen herself as uh, a cosmopolitan person on the move with a lot of networks, uh, I'm not so sure. I think I think it would be very hard to find an individual who would. Uh, you would not find an individual at all who would who would uh, correspond to that in their own mind because uh, these concepts are to these concepts are the ones that uh, we are using and we are using them on people who never went anywhere because they happen to be a part of a global network that we have imposed on them. So that's our job as global historians um, to come up with these uh, tools. Thank you. Uh, just a quick uh, remark first and then my concluding stupidities. And uh, uh, this is just regard what you said about the global north and uh, south respectively. I think it's one approach which is among I mean, Elena Waller from the University of Helsinki. She talks also about uh, uh, regard to fragmented development, fragmentarische Entwicklung, and the fact that we have a, like, because the idea, I mean, global north and south, they can also be seen more like as something like uh, mobile. I mean, in other words, we have pockets of global south here, and in the global south you have pockets of the global north, and this is just a very black and white presentation now. But still, I mean, this is, it's not as clear cut as we would like to uh, see. But this all, all this discussion has made me think also about what is the role of a responsible like a historian in this age. And that brought to my mind uh, uh, what uh, Michel Foucault, in one of his, in my view, very sensible uh, ideas regarding the craft of the historian, and he said that in, an, uh, in a very short essay that for him the ethos of a historian is resistance to the present. In other, way, in other words, to uh, lay bare the alternative futures in the past and contesting the notion that the present is a result of some kind of teleological development because this if following this li line of reasoning, it leads to the fact that the present as well as the future, they are open, and they are uh, open for contestation, and that's a very democratic call. Yes, uh, and in, in conclusion, I, I just wanted to, to, to state that I'm excited for the next uh, seminar we have here, which is going to be talking a lot of time. I peeped through the articles. And <laughs> It's one fantastic article about how time defines space and all that, and and also Patrick's really interesting perspective towards, you know, time moving faster, 
how the speed of time defines the global. Like today, we put uh, we place this podcast on the internet, and it's already defining a global um, event in that sense. And and also how then we can we should rethink time as historians. Although I see myself as a histofuturist, so to speak, <laughs> which is more tricky. But but then it it takes us back to how then we should rethink time in our craft as as people who study the past and think about the past and how the immediacy of 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 the global uh, an immediate global to us and to probably a peasant in in the caribbean for example because when he when he harvests his sugar or something to him it's also an immediate global but then the phenomena of the internet today and, and the accoutrements of what makes probably postmodernity today define give us a definition of, of global as immediate, so to speak. So I think it's going to be a really interesting um, uh, discussion the next time we think and think about time and space and then how time especially defines, defines this concept of global. Thank you. Thank you for uh, this discussion today. The part two of the critique from Adaman and the question of is the global history in a crisis mm -hmm. has been answered for now yes. and uh, will return in our next podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.